Yep, we're good. Good. You put in bird sounds too, right? Yep. On the opening? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I can hear it on my phone. Good. All right. I'll trust your phone. So, also we're, you can hear that.
my name is Caitlin Ellison. I'm elementary school districts, studios, and with all of you here joining us on YouTube. I can't wait to share another science lesson with all of my friends that are joining us here today. My friends, I can't wait to be able to do this, but before we get started, I want to tell you a little bit more about what we're going to be learning about here today. You see, this is the fifth time that my friends and I with Inside the Outdoors have joined you to be able to share a science lesson and also get to interview a special guest. Today, my friends, we're going to be learning all about plants and how they can change the way that fire interacts with our areas here in California. Our special guest today is my brother, James Purrington, who is a firefighter with the Los Angeles County Fire Department. And we're really excited to get to hear from him and all about how he was able to achieve his goals and start this career. But my friends, before we get to that interview, I want to go over some ways that you can interact with today's program here. You see, we have the chat open and available for you to write any answers to questions or to ask questions that you might have as well. My friend Mrs. Brown is over here monitoring the chat, so she'll be able to relay any ideas that you might have. But my friends, let's make sure that we keep this chat on topic and to, so that we're not very distracting in it. We want to make it sure that it's appropriate as well. So that's going to be a great way to be able to interact. The second thing that you can do is if you have a piece of paper nearby and maybe something to write or draw with, you can actually take some notes on today's presentation and maybe get to follow it along with it that way as well. So my friends, we can't wait to get started with this. And before our science lesson, we actually have that special guest who we're going to interview as well. So again, his name is James Purrington, and he is a firefighter with the Los Angeles County Fire Department. So let's go ahead and let's tune in and check in with him and maybe get to interview him a little bit. So let's go and see what he's up to. Hello, James, how are you? Hi, Caitlin, I'm great, how are you? I'm doing really well. Thank you so much for joining us here and talking a little bit more about your career and how you got where you are today. We can't wait to hear from you. So let's go ahead and get started with this interview. James, why did you choose this career to be a firefighter? Well, growing up, I had a lot of different, you know, kind of career paths and uh, ways of thinking maybe what I wanted to be. I went through a lot of different phases of things I wanted to be, like you know. Um, but I chose to become a firefighter. Um, you know, there's always been something kind of deep down inside of me that wanted to help people, wanted to be um, almost bigger than myself and my community and the people that I serve. And that was kind of the main thing that drove me all these years was just knowing once I did do the job and once I got the job that I would be able to really help people in some of their hardest times lives and make an impact on my community and the various people that we serve um, on a day-to-day -day basis, whatever their problems may be, and, and just be able to be there in a time where they need us the most. You know, I think that's really great that you'd like to serve people and are out there helping them every single day. Can you tell me one thing, what's the biggest thing that you enjoy about your career? Uh, kind of tying to what I just mentioned about the first question, the uh, biggest thing that I personally enjoy about my career is getting to, you know, just get up every day and go to work. It's such a great thing to, to do and um, go out there and serve um, the people in the district that I, that I work in and be able to make an impact, like I said, in their lives um, and most of the time help them, um, you know, whether they're sick or they're not feeling well or something bad has happened, being able to go out there and kind of um, be a presence, um, almost like a security to them and have them kind of be, be calmer when we show up and uh, be able to have the knowledge to fix the problem um, and then get them the care that they need. That's, that's my favorite part about the job. So you're mentioning this kind of care aspect of it as well. So it sounds like you're doing a lot more than just fighting fires and wildfires as well. 
So can you tell us a little bit more about what an average typical day looks like you, for you from when you wake up to when you go to bed, how long are your shifts, those kinds of things? So I, I wake up um, from the house typically around 5.30, and that'll put me at work um, a little bit before 6.30. Um, and when I get to work, I mean, every, not everyone's nonstop at the station. It's, it's not like I'm getting to work and I'm sitting down for periods of time or hardly ever sitting down. But we're always, you know, we do all of our own chores inside the fire station. It's kind of like living in your house, you know. So, like, if your parents tell you to do something, like, your parents aren't there at the station. So, you're the guy that has to do everything. So, we all work together as a team. And we clean the station. We clean the bathrooms. You know, we make sure that it's all tidy and that the fire engines look good, that they've been washed and, you know, they're ready for the day. And then we have kind of a morning meeting. Um, and then after that, uh, we like to stay physically fit. So we work out in the morning, have that uh, crucial part of our day each day. Um, we do work 24 hours um, in, a, in a set schedule that the uh, county has provided. And um, yeah, and then from there, it's whatever the city wants to give us as far as Calls are concerned, you know, whether it's people that are sick and medical calls to fires, to car accidents, to um, whatever you can think of. It's all out there, and we've we've got to see most of it. So, so you yeah. mentioned that it's 24 hours. Is that every single day, or how many days a week do you work? So um, my schedule is um, a day on, a day off, a day on two days off and then we rotate again a day on a day off on four days off now it's really important to have it may not seem like a lot but it's really important to have those days off um, because we don't get to see our families a lot and you know we we don't get to spend time with our loved ones as much being there for 24 hours um, my shift my schedule is a little bit more busy I work um, there's a lot of good ability for over and so working overtime is a great way to a just get some more experience and um you know help out but um make more money so that you can help your family and stuff like that um so i work a lot more days than that but yeah that's really neat to hear so we talked about like what you enjoy about your physical job as well but is there anything that is kind of your your favorite thing to do while you're on your work schedule while i'm on my work shift yeah, either at the station, in the in your uh, engine, or anything like that. Um, I would definitely say one of one of my favorite thing to do is um, around the station is honestly eat dinner and eat lunch. Eating dinner um, at the station is a really cool, you know, experience. Obviously, it's been kind of. Um, it's been kind of iffy lately because of the COVID and stuff like that. Our guidelines that we you know partake in and stuff as far as dinner and, and keeping mind being mindful of the uh, coronavirus situation um, um, but that's one of my favorite times because you know just getting to interact with the fellow firefighters and you know the captains and the engineers we're all have we're like a big family at the station so it's it's a lot of a lot of fun and that's my favorite part is just being to be uh, personal and know these people and, you know, get to tell stories, hear stories. It's really good. That's really neat to hear. I'm glad you're enjoying that aspect of it. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit more about how you got to this position? Some of the schooling that you took? Did you go to a four-year? Did you go to a technical college? What, what did your schooling look like in order to get this position? So I, I actually go to a four-year. Uh, I don't have my four-year degree. Um, not to say that it wouldn't have benefited me, it definitely would have, um, but immediately out of high school, I um, went to uh, Orange Coast College down here in Costa Mesa, and I got my associate's degree. While I was there, I took an EMT class, that get, which is an emergency medical technician, explains a lot of medical things about um, 
the care that you provide to your patients before they end up going to the hospital. Um, so I learned a lot about that. Um, it kind of made me really, really interested. I kind of already wanted to be a firefighter in high school, but this was the thing that kind of pushed me. And then from there, I went to uh, uh, Santa Ana College in Orange County as well. And they have a really good fire program there. So it's a about six or seven fire tech classes that teach you um, all the different types of things, anywhere between what makes fires big, what makes fires small, what, how is fire made, you know, what type of uh, construction materials do we build our homes that, um, you know, can cause fire to spread, or what is the, uh, the wildland fires look like, how you calm so there was a lot of different things I learned there, and that took two years as well. So I actually have, as far as formal education, I have two associate degrees. And then when I was at Santa Ana College, I went through their um, college fire academy, which you remember. I had to shave my head yes. and <laughs> do all that stuff. And it's, it's kind of, it's almost like a military um, thing. Um, so you go there and you get all the hands-on training and it was, I want to say it was about four, four months of hands-on training, um, about four to five days a week. And yeah, it teaches you a lot. And I learned a lot and, um, just, uh, took a EMT test and became a certified emergency medical technician. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much all the schooling I did as far as learning a lot from other people that have already been on the job. Okay, so thinking more about this school and kind of going rewinding back a few years, 10, 15 years, when you were in elementary school or when you were in middle school, were there any classes or any subjects that really you found yourself drawn to that led you kind of in this career path? Um, looking back, um, I Something that I wish I would have done. I believe it's still something you can do. Is I, I'm, I could be mistaken, but I believe it's in middle school that they offer it, and they also offer it. I think it's an ROP class, and it's a emergency medical class. Basically, they teach you a lot about that stuff, and there's so much involved with that that I think the earlier, if you want to be a firefighter or curious about the medical field. Um, that's a good class to take because it teaches you a lot of information about those things. But um, a few of the things that I was really drawn to in um, middle school, elementary school, high school was a lot of classes that were hands-on. So like I remember in high school, I was really drawn to like the auto tech class and because I got to work on it, stuff like that, which directly correlates to uh, we work on all various types of tools, and we fix them all at our station most of the time. Um, in um, middle school, I was really drawn to sports and stuff like that, and obviously my job was really active, so it kept me active. And elementary school, um, anything that basically, like I said, just got my hands on things, I was able to take apart things and figure things out and enjoy my time working with people and i know right now it's kind of weird with covid19 but you know i really enjoyed being around people and i'm sure there's a lot of kids out there that enjoy being around people too and helping people and that's obviously entirely our job so yeah that seems like a really major part of what you're doing in your career as well that's cool to yeah. see kind of looking back on it how you were able to see uh, bits and pieces of your personality and in school as well that kind of led you here so I want to switch gears a little bit, going back to your job. Does your job change on a daily basis, or is it is it pretty consistent? No, I, uh, I think it's, there are many jobs, left, but I think that I would put my job up many jobs. It is the most versatile job out there. We There's never the same same call. There's never the same fire. There's never the same, you know, whatever you're going on. Everything changes on a day-to-day -day basis. Even station life can change. Um, we could have, you know, back when visitors were allowed, we have visitors come by. 
or we were going to birthday parties and the big fire fire engine or the fire truck, you know, and we're talking to kids and, you know, showing them the equipment and, and, you know, they're all happy and stuff like that. And it's always a great thing, but it changes so much and you just have to rely upon your training that you've received and be able to have a foundation to work off of that, to handle that ever-changing uh, world that is pre-hospital medical care, so. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So on the same page as changes, how have you seen kind of the fires in California? It seems to be a big thing in the news, especially around our summer times, how we're getting kind of larger and bigger fires and seems like a lot more nowadays. How have you personally seen the fire ecology in California change throughout the past couple of years? Yeah, California is kind of in uh, a hot spot for fires. I mean, around the country, obviously, they have wildfires and stuff like that that are, are devastating as well. But here in California, we have um, a very diverse uh, plant structure, you know, different plants, invasive species not to mention, you know, homes and stuff everywhere um, inside our uh, wildland area. But, yeah, you know, it's, I haven't been a firefighter for that long. Um, not guys that have 20, 30 years on the job, and I'm sure they've seen some um, some changes, too. Uh, I've been on a few myself, uh, some pretty good ones. And, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting when you mentioned the plants and stuff like that, and things have changed because of, different types of species and because of how versatile are I mean we don't have a whole lot of seasons but occasionally we do get rain and we get rain heavy rain and um, that rain causes things to grow and then when it dries out and we don't have rain it causes those things to dry out and if the plants are not equipped to um, face those types of environmental changes in our uh, ecosystem they're they're going to dry up and that's going to cause more fire what we would call as fire fuel so a lot more stuff to burn basically mm, that's really interesting and we'll get to explore that a little bit more in today's science program i know we've talked about that as well but i kind of want to leave you with or ask you one last question for our audience that's uh, over here i want to ask if some if someone's looking at your job, hearing what you're saying here today, and thinking, hmm, that sounds like something I'm really interested in, maybe this is my future career path, could you give some advice on either what they should do or anything that they should look into or ways to find more information? Yeah, absolutely. That's a good point, Caitlin. Um, if anyone wants to find more information, not only about my department, but in, but you know, there's a lot of other great departments out there, um, you know, and it doesn't hurt to just go on their website. So if you're curious about whatever department you're looking at, just go to the website, and um, you can look up some information there. Some departments have volunteering, some departments have uh, reserves, which are basically. Um, you're like a firefighter, but not necessarily do all the firefighter stuff, but you work around in the culture and stuff like that. And you get to work with people that have the occupation of the firefighter, and you get to learn a lot about that. And then also, the best thing you can do is sometimes just walk into your fire station, not or we get it all the time, and, uh, you know, ask, hey, how, where do I get started? Can you help me? And you're going to find however many guys there at the station, they're all going to want to help you, you know, and they're all going to want to make sure that you succeed. And is um, making sure that if you want um, a few other things that you can do is, um, yeah, like I said, get educated, take some classes early would be my advice if you're curious in it. Um, just take some classes um, whether it's you're in college or whether it's you're in elementary school and stuff like that. In elementary schools, they don't have a whole lot, but like I mentioned, in middle school or high school, they have the ROP medical class you can take, I believe, depending on if your school provides it. Um, so you could do those things um, to make sure that you like the, the profession and that it interests you. 
Um, but yeah, just it's a long process, like you know, and it takes some time. But I think the biggest thing is just have a hope, like have hope that you, if you put your mind to it, you will get hired. And you got to be persevering to get hired and almost be a little a little aggressive to want to get hired and stuff like that and you gotta talk to people and gain as much knowledge as you can up here and learn as much as you can and um if you have all those things i'm with training you'll be successful so well james thank you so much for joining us here today and for this interview um i hope our viewers at home learned a lot more about what the average day of a firefighter looks like and the kinds of work that you were able to do. We appreciate you coming out here and I'll see you soon. Okay. Bye, James. One more thing, oh, one more thing. Yes, go ahead, Megan. We have some questions for you. So um, one student wants to know what kind of problems firefighters typically face. Ooh, what problems do you typically face? What problems do firefighters typically face? Um, well, Typically, people only call us when there is a problem. So there's a lot of problems we face. Um, uh, I guess, like I mentioned before, we have some medical problems. You know, whether it's you know loved ones that are having you know heart attacks, and we need to figure out how to fix that. All the way down to people that maybe just slip, tripped, and fall, and they you know have problems with their body structure. You know, like maybe they hurt their leg or they hurt their hip or something and we need to get there to make sure that they get the best possible care that we can possibly give. Um, all the way down to, you know, cars on the freeways or the streets, you know, being and stuff like that, making sure those people are okay. Because car accidents are big deals too. So we deal with basically our my department um, is what we call an all risk department. So we handle um, I, everything in between. So fires, medicals, hazmat calls, um, search and rescue calls, water rescues, um, wildfire. I mean, we send teams up when there's big fires and we all go for many, many weeks at a time without coming back home and we'll go out there and uh, fight the fires in the wildfires. So we deal with a, a lot of various types of problems. It sounds really versatile. Megan, are there any other questions? Yeah, there's one more burning question that was, kind of, that was in on the chat, and it is, how often do you put out fires? How Ooh. often do fires come across your line of work? So how often do you put out fires personally? How often do they come through your work? Um, so every, like I mentioned, uh, my, my station, every year we, um, we have two engines at my station and then a paramedic truck, which are the paramedics that have essentially more experience in the medical field and they're certified paramedic. Um, so one of the engines every year during fire season, like we talked about with uh, wildfires, it'll go um, out on what we call a strike team. So they'll go out and they will um, stay out there for long periods of time, just four guys on the engine with many other engines and fight those wildfires. So I did that last summer. Um, my station's fairly busy as far as fires. We get them frequently. Um, it's kind of a, like a lower, a lower income area um, where they some of the houses necessarily don't have some of, the, some of the safety precautions that we would like them to have. Um, and because of that, you know, maybe burners get left on or whatever causes those structure fires is what we call them, structure fires. Um, we get quite frequently due to just maybe faulty wiring. It could be whatever. Um, we also have a very high population of uh, persons experiencing homelessness. And so sometimes we get those fires on the side of the freeway or things like that, um, where they accidentally tip over a cooking stove or something that catches a tarp and then a tree. So we get that too. Uh, we also get little grass fires um, on the side of the freeway too. Like, like you mentioned, some of the plants, like one of the plants is mustard. We have some mustard that is just dry, dried up on the side of the freeway 
And if we get a cigarette butt in the wrong direction and it just goes into the side of the freeway, you know, we, we have a little grass fire. So we get those, um, and then we get car fires. So we get a little of everything, and it's at my station, it's pretty frequent. So it sounds like kind of the bigger wildfires are, are few and far between, maybe a couple times a year, but those, those daily occurrences of homes or kind of cars or structures, that's a, a, a higher experience, you'd say? Oh, yeah. Uh, you're guaranteed at least uh, to see fire once a shift. You're, you're going you're gonna to see it, if not multiple times. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for answering some of our questions. And uh, we hope that you have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, James. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. Bye. All right, bye. All right, my friends, thank you so much, and we hope that James has a great rest of his day, and we can't wait to maybe learn a little bit more. Maybe you could do some research on what it's like to be a firefighter, and maybe if that interests you, like he said, continue that approach and continue looking into some of those classes that maybe later on in the future you could take. But my friends, we have a science lesson that we're going to go over today as well. And like James was saying, our fire is kind of changing here in California. And he was mentioning that one of the factors that's changing our fire is plants. So for today's science lesson, we're going to be talking all about plants and how they are able to take a look and see how they can change our fire ecology in this area as well. So my friends, before we get started with those plants, we want to take a look at what causes fire in the first place. So we're going to take a look at our presentation here today and learn all about fire and plants. So let's go ahead and do that now. My friends, today we're taking a look at how native and invasive species of plants can change our fire ecology. So let's talk a little bit more about how plants are able to do this. And we need to learn how fire is created in the first place as well. So my friends, this diagram here is something that we like to call the fire triangle. And the reason that it's in the shape of a triangle is because there are three things that every single fire needs in order to start. And without one of these three things, we won't get a fire. So my friends, our first item on our fire triangle is this heat here. And heat is something that can cause a fire to ignite. So in the chat, I want us to think about this one. What do you think are some sources of heat that could be involved in a fire. So where do you think we get sources of heat from? And then Miss Megan Brown will look in the chat and let me know what we're seeing. We had to start thinking about it and it was a little less. Yeah, we gotta think about that. Oh, sunlight. Yeah, sunlight is an, a source of heat for sure. It's a great answer. The sun, for sure. The sun is one source of heat. Can we think of any other sources of heat? What else could be warm that could bring heat to our fire triangle? What other ideas are coming in? Well, why don't I give you some of my ideas as well while we wait? So my friends, another one that can happen out in nature is lightning. So lightning can be a source of heat. It's a natural source of heat um, that can come from storms or things like that, especially in the summer months. Uh, when that hits the ground, it can ignite some fires as well. Ooh, so water, hot water can't necessarily start a fire because it is still water, and water actually helps us to put out fires. Global warming, it doesn't directly uh, start a fire, but it can also, it can change the way that fires are happening in this area. My friends, some other sources of heat can be non-natural, like human sources, such as matches or campfires, stoves, like my brother was saying, wiring in a house. All those are some sources of heat that can cause these fires. Are there any more in the chat? Uh, it sounds like Mrs. Winston Howard's class is watching together and they're agreeing that heat can come from the sun and from fire. 
Yes. Yeah, even other fires, things like campfires, can be a source of heat. Ooh, gas can help to create heat, but that's actually in a different portion of our fire triangle. So I like that thinking, but we're not quite there yet. We'll talk about that in just a second, I promise. So let's go to our next portion of our fire triangle. We've talked about that heat, things like sunlight, lightning, those matches, all that are sources of heat. Let's talk about this blue one, our oxygen. So my friends, where can a fire get oxygen from? I don't want to tell you a hint. It's the same place that you and I get oxygen from. That's easy. How do you and I or anything else that needs it get oxygen? Is that something you go to the store to get? I have seen it in the store. Yeah, I would agree. Our trees provide oxygen um, and they place that back into the air. So when the trees provide that oxygen, it goes into the air, my friends, and the air is all around us. The only place we wouldn't be able to find this oxygen is probably in space. So that's why you can't create fires in space. But my friends, here on Earth, we have a plentiful amount of this oxygen all floating around us every single day. Yes. Yes, those plants do provide that oxygen for us and also for fires too. So my friends, our final one, and this is the one that we're going to be focusing on a lot here today, is our fuel, our fuel sources. And this is something that the fire can burn, keeps the fire burning. So we can think about our campfires, we can think about maybe fires uh, that we put in our fireplaces, what do we usually place in there to help it burn? And one of those things that was brought up earlier was that gas. Gas is a source of fuel for fires. It provides that fire something to burn. So let's see, what other sources of fuel can we think of? Oil and gasoline are two good things for fire. That's why we use them in the car. We use them as fuel in our car because actually what's happening in our car is kind of like a miniature fire and that's what helps to make our car run. I would agree. Um, Yeah, that gas, and I agree as well. Trees and branches and all those plants, that's what fuels our natural fires, our ones that happen in our wildfires as well. Some other sources of fuel, uh, if it's like a structure fire, like my brother was telling us, it could be what the home is made out of. So if the home's made out of wood, or maybe there's some cloth in there as well. Blankets could burn, clothing can burn. Anything that comes from plants, is most likely to burn as well. So those are some great ideas. Are there any more ideas of what types of fuel? Um, Allison and Ella are agreeing that wood is a great source of fuel, while um, the California Rail Banner is saying cardboard and lighters. Yeah, cardboard is another really good source of fuel. And I agree, lighters, they have the fuel and the heat, and all it needs is the oxygen around us, and that's what creates that fire in the lighter. Yes, dead grass is especially one of those, and we're going to get into that a little bit more as well. So my friends, this is our fire triangle, and like we said, we are going to be focusing on this one, the fuel. And we talked a little bit more about how plants are fuel, and we're going to be focusing on plants as fuel for the purpose of today's program. 
So let's take a look at some of our plants. My friends, the first part we're going to start off with is something called native plants. And a native plant is defined as a plant that can be found naturally growing in a particular area. They have unique characteristics that help them to survive in that particular area. So what this means, my friends, is that if we were to come into California, these plants have always been here. They weren't brought over from another part of the world. They were just found naturally growing here. And they have really unique adaptations and characteristics to survive in California. My friends, a lot of these plants are what we call fire resistant. That means that they have characteristics that help them to survive in an area where fire is frequent. Here in California, we get a lot of fires. That's been the case for years and years and years. While it might be changing a little bit, fires have been occurring here since California began, what, millions of years ago. So my friends, this fire resistance is what we're gonna be focusing on and we're gonna take a look at some of our native plants to see how, what adaptations they have that make them fire resistant or to help make them less likely to burn. So my friends, our first plant that we're going to take a look at is the coast live oak. And this coast live oak can be found all over Southern California. And this is what we're going to be looking at. So my friends, in the chat, I want you to take a look at this picture. And I want you to think of some descriptive words that you would be able to tell me about this plant. So maybe take a look at its branches, its leaves, uh, maybe take a look at where it's growing. What do you notice about this plant? So and I'll wait a little bit. I know that there's a little bit of delay, so I'll wait for the chat. What do we notice? How would we describe portions of this plant? So again, thinking about the different parts of it, its leaves, maybe its stem, maybe its branches. What does it look it's like? It's a large tree because, you know, different from the trees that we might have around our homes here, this is quite large. I would agree, it is quite large. This one over here is probably close to about 40, 50 feet tall. It's pretty big. Mm -hmm. What else do you notice about the tree? Look at the color. Look at the branches, look at the shape of the leaves. What does it remind you of, maybe? You know, one of the things that I notice about this tree is that its branches are really twisted. They mm -hmm. kind of look like they're not growing straight like a palm tree. They're really, really twisted and even twist around each other. Yeah, Diana, um, the teacher, says that Selena said that the branches are curved, and a third grade class says that it has really small leaves. You know, I would agree. Those branches, Selena, are really curved, like we said. And these leaves are really tiny as well. Here in California, we don't get a lot of water, and so those leaves need to be really, really small in order to survive. So those are some good observations, my friends. Last one says large with big branches. Large and really, really big branches. I would agree. So my friends, this plant does have some fire resistant protections uh, that it has adapted to be able to live in the Southern California area. It has really, really thick bark. Its bark can be inches thick and this helps protect the inner portion of the plant, the living portion of the plant from being burned if a fire were to come through this area. It also has large roots. Its roots are almost as large as the crown or the branches on this plant as well. So this allows it to grow really, really far deep down into the soil to access water to help it to grow as well. It also keeps it stable in the ground, preventing it from falling over underneath winds or rain or even fires too. So my friends, the last protection that it has is this one here the re-sprouting. Now what this means is if a fire were to come into an area where the coast live oak is, if it got burned a little bit, this plant can actually regrow 
a lot of its leaves and regrow some of its branches even after it gets burned. So it's able to use those long roots to access those water and nutrients and regrow even after a fire. So let's take a look at our next plant, which is my personal favorite plant, the California poppy. This is actually our state plant as well, our state flower. And I want us to take a look at this one and do the same thing that we did earlier and maybe make some descriptive words for this plant. Think about ways that you would describe this plant. One of the things that I notice is that it is bright orange. It's a really bright orange color. And we can wait a little bit for the chat. <laughs> One of the watchers is, um, likes this plant and says that he's going to start growing those. Yeah, I used to grow these in my backyard as well. They make for really great, beautiful wildflowers. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I noticed, my friends, is that over in this picture, it looks like they have started to kind of curve or fold into each other. I'm wondering why that might be the case. You know, I've seen some flowers that do that when it becomes a little bit darker, and then they'll reopen in the morning. So I wonder if that's doing what this one's doing. One user says that it looks like a butterfly. Oh, it looks like a butterfly. Yeah, these kind of butterfly-shaped petals, I would agree. They're really delicate flowers like the butterfly as well. Good observation. Hmm, I wonder if there's a reason why this flower is this color. Mm. That's a good idea. There's you observations know. that the flowers are growing in large groups. Yeah, I see that as well. It doesn't look like there's just one or two of them. They're growing in really, really large groups. So my friends, the interesting thing about this color is sometimes it's called the fire poppy as well, because this flower really likes to grow after a fire comes in. It can be one of the first plants to grow after a fire, and it allows it to kind of change the soil and allow for nutrients to be made for other plants too. They also don't catch on fire very easily. This means that they're a little bit fire resistant. They don't have any oils or anything that can catch fire within the plant itself and they kind of have a high heat. They don't burn at a really low heat. They are also drought tolerant which means that in here in California sometimes we go through periods of drought where we don't have a lot of water or a lot of rain, and these plants are able to survive those times because they don't require as much water as some of our other plants in this area. So my friends, this is California poppy, another fire-adapted native species of plant. And we have one more that we're gonna talk about in our native area. This one is called black sage, and let's go ahead and make some descriptions about this one as well. So one of the things that I notice about this plant is on its leaves, it appears like there's little bumps and kind of veins that go through it as well. It's got really bumpy leaves. It's one of the things I noticed about it. And it's also a really bright green color. It's really nice and bright green. So let's see, is there any other ideas and descriptions in our chat? Uh, right now they're still talking about the poppy and how beautiful it is and some of the different observations. I think the chat's catching up slowly. Yeah, that poppy is one of my favorites. It's a beautiful, beautiful fire. Or, sorry, beautiful plant on fire. <laughs> <laughs> now where, while the chat is going, where is the black sage in the picture on the left? So this on the left is all black sage. The texture from yes. that far away. And these brown bits of this is actually their dried flowers. So their flowers will kind of grow and they're kind of a light white or purple color. And then in the summer months, they'll dry up. And this is what's left behind are kind of the flower pods or the seed pods of the plant. Some observations are coming in that the leaves themselves on the picture on the right look thick. Yeah, the leaves. they're mm -hmm. pretty thick. They're not super wide, but they're about as thick as if you were to hold up one finger. That's about how wide they are. 
And the actual length of them, they can be really, really thick as well. They're not very thin plants. Students say that they look small, and another class says it looks like a mint plant. It looks Ooh. like the leaves are thin, looks very dry in some areas. I like how someone mentioned it looks like mint. I would agree it does look like mint, but you know what? This plant actually has a really fragrant smell, just like mint. It's a little bit different, but it has that really, really nice smell to it. It's very similar to the sage that you use in cooking. That's kind of a very similar smell. One glass observed that the plant itself looks like the letter X, where it crisscrosses right there. Yes, those leaves, they create those crisscrosses, and they go kind of spiraling up the stem. I would agree with that. Ice and observation. Another class says that they noticed that the black sage has thin leaves, berries, dark colored stems, and bumpy leaves. Yeah, those bumpy leaves, darker colored stems, we can see those over here, and those seed pods on there as well. These are some great observations of this plant. My friends, it is a bush plant, so it's not, it doesn't grow like a tree does, it doesn't grow like a flower. It kind of creates like a bush or a shrub, um, and it only gets about a couple feet tall, about three to four feet max. Um, but these are all plants that can be found in Southern California, especially here in Orange County. Asking, is it an herb? I don't believe it's, I think in the cooking realm it's categorized as an herb. Uh, but for science, I don't believe it's categorized as an herb for this science. This would be the same sage that you might find on... Like, a very a similar one, similar. yes. Okay. A very Great similar question. species. You can actually use this one in cooking and mm -hmm. substitute of that one. All right. So my friends, these are some of our native species of plants that all have fire adaptations. This one in particular, just like the California poppy, it can grow back very quickly after a fire. It can re-sprout like our California oak. Um, this one does also, if it gets a little bit burned, can re-sprout some of those leaves. But this one also has protective seeds. So it has seeds that have a protective coating on it that can help prevent them from being burned as well so it can regrow. So my friends, I want to talk a little bit more about how fire, what happens when fire comes through this area. This is what we call fire succession. And it's a chart showing the pattern of growth of plants after a fire. So way over on this side, we have kind of our native area, our natural uh, area. After a fire, we're going to lose a lot of those wildflowers. We're going to lose a lot of our small shrubs and any maybe smaller newly growing trees as well. So that's what this is showing here. A few months after the fire, after we get some rains, after everything's kind of settled down, we're going to start to see some of our wildflowers and some of our native grasses growing back as well. So that's what you see here. These are the first ones to grow back after a fire. Like we talked about those California poppies, they love to grow back after that fire. We'll also start to see some of our larger woody, woody plants like this oak tree start to re-sprout at some of the tips of the branches. So this is proof that even if it has a little bit of burn scars on it, it can still regrow. After some more time, after a few more months, maybe a few years or so, it will start to grow some new woodier plants, like those oaks, um, if there's seeds left in the ground. The bushes will start to grow back in as well. Things like sage, uh, sagebrush, any of those plants can start to grow back in. Even buckwheat will start to grow. As well as maybe our uh, wildflowers and our native grasses, as these new plants come in, they're going to start to take a step back and there won't be as many of them. Eventually, over the next few years, these trees will get bigger, start to re-sprout even more and mature, as well as we'll start to see kind of some of our bushes and more of our native plants pop up over time. So my friends, in an area like this, um, with all native plants, fire doesn't usually come through an area more than about once every 15 to 50 years. So it's a long time for a fire to come through the exact same area. It might get close, but fires aren't as frequent as they are now. And one of the things that's leading to this frequency of our fire that we're seeing today is something that my brother was telling us about, those invasive plants. These are plants, my friends, that have been introduced to our area from somewhere else, whether it's from another part of the United States, another country, or even somewhere on the other side of the world. 
These plants might have been introduced here on purpose for landscaping reasons or by accident thinking that if a bit of it just gets over here from maybe on a boat or maybe someone's shoe or anything like that, these can spread into California. We don't really want these plants here because they start to change the way that fire interacts with our area as well as they start to change the way that some of our native animals interact as well. Most of these invasive species, our native animals don't know how to eat them, they don't know how to use them. They can also take resources such as sunlight, water, and space away from some of those native growing plants like the poppy or that black sage. So my friends, two really common ones in this area, one of them is black mustard, and this is the one that my brother was telling you about that can cause fires on the sides of our roads. These plants really like to grow in disturbed areas or areas that have been changed by humans, whether that be after a fire, the sides of a road, or on trails. They grow really, really well in places that other plants can't. So we can see this one. This one's actually growing right along the side of a chain link fence on the side of a road. This one over here, it's growing right in the middle of a trail. And this one is really, really common in Southern California. If you've ever driven across the 241 or the 91, in our late spring, we'll see this covering the hills. We have those yellow hills of California. Well, it's actually a species that was brought over from the Mediterranean. We're not exactly sure how it got to California in the first place, but all we know is that we can't stop it from growing. It's growing crazy here. And it's actually preventing a lot of those poppies and other wildflowers from growing as well. They can grow really, really tall, about six feet tall. So in the chat, my friends, is there anything that you notice about this plant? Can you go ahead and make any descriptions about this plant? And I'm going to tell you one that I notice. I notice these dark green leaves. They kind of spread out and they have some little like notches on them as well. So let's think about this. Is there anything that we see that we would like to describe? Waiting for the chat to come in. Someone says that the plants themselves are bright yellow in color. Yeah, we can see these flowers up here for sure. That's that yellow that we see on those hills. Waiting for more responses while well, we're, we're waiting for that. Why is it called black mustard? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the, it's obviously not has to do with the color. It's just kind of a namesake. I believe it's because the seeds, when they dry out, they get a little bit darker. Um, but there's all sorts of different kinds of mustard. There's field mustard, uh, there's savanna mustard. It's just kind of a namesake that we give them. Okay. Um, just more on the color yellow. Now my friends, it is called mustard, and I know you're thinking about the yellow mustard maybe in your house. Um, it is a very similar species, just like the black sage is similar to the one we use for cooking. This one's really similar to the one that we use for mustard as well. The stem almost looks like a really long straw. Yeah, and it can branch off of it as well. Um, that long kind of thin stem on older plants can actually get to be the size of like a quarter or larger around in diameter. Is there anything else? All right. My friends, we have another plant. Uh, this is our second invasive species that's causing a lot of problems for our fire. This is called cheat grass. And before I tell you a little bit more about this, go ahead and again, put some descriptions in those chat, and then I can come back after I tell you about it to kind of talk us through it. Uh, this one is actually also from the Mediterranean area. And this one, uh, we actually do know how it got here to California. It was accidentally brought over in some shipping materials. Uh, you know, like those package, those packing peanuts? Well, it wasn't like that originally, but kind of that packaging material. Some of this cheatgrass was found in it, 
and it got spread into the wilderness areas and began to grow like crazy as well. Um, it kind of looks like wild oat as well. It kind of looks, it's got these seed pods in here as well. Um, and it doesn't grow as tall as the mustard. It only grows about a foot or so, but it can be spread really, really far. Are these the plants that get stuck in my dog's tail if we go on hikes? These are one of them. There's also other ones like foxtails and stuff, but yeah, these seeds will pop up and they've got like a little barb at the end of them that can get stuck in clothing or fur too. Good question. I'm seeing a lot of responses coming in from the previous description, but one about this one says um, that my class notices it looks dry, it looks like wheat. Yeah. And so we're going to talk about how that dryness is a bit of a problem. Uh, you see both this one and the mustard, they dry out really quickly. They do not do well in the summer heat whatsoever. Unlike that California poppy that can survive with a low amount of water, this one and our black mustard, they cannot survive well at all. These will actually die almost every single year in the summer months, and then in the winter months, uh, when we get some rain, they will actually re-sprout and regrow, and then they'll go through that same process again, where they die off in the summer. Do we have any other descriptions? Uh, wheat, it looks like wheat, cattails, they look light <coughs> wheat. Yeah, it definitely looks like wheat as well. It can grow a ton of these seeds too. So my friends, like I said, these both will dry out in those summer months. And because of that, it actually changes the way that fire comes in through this area. This is kind of what that succession or that pattern looks like when we start to introduce invasive species into our area. Like we saw in our original chart, we have over here, uh, we have our kind of native area uh, with our oak trees, those poppies, and those black sage. And if a fire comes through here, it will do the same thing like before, where we're left with kind of some of our bigger oak trees um, and some dry grasses down below there. Um, but if we have invasive species in this area, if they've been introduced, you might start to notice that some of these invasive plants will grow back even quicker after a fire than some of our native species. And my friends, these grow crazy. They grow so much and they don't stop growing. And they compete with all of those native plants so that poppies can't even grow here anymore. Our native grasses and that black sage, we don't even see them here. When the summer months come and all of these plants here dry out, it puts it at a risk for an even bigger fire that year. And that's what we can see here, my friends. This fire is burning a lot hotter, a lot more intense, and a lot longer than they would in an area that has those native plants. So we can compare the fires and see how they're a little bit different. This one's a lot bigger, a lot more fuel it has to burn. It can burn for a lot longer and at a higher heat, making it harder to fight making it a lot more harder to put out. And after this happens for a few times, even those oak trees, even those really, really strong oak trees that had really good resistance against that fire can eventually no longer be able to make it. These fires that once were taking anywhere from 15 to 50 years to come through an area now get reduced to about five to 10, 15 years. So they can come much quicker in this area because there's more of this fuel, more of these plants um, that are changing the way that our fire is interacting with this area. So my friends, I know this is kind of sad, but I want to tell you that there is some hope as well. So there's some things that we can do to prevent this and kind of reverse the course of those fires for our area. And let me tell you a little bit more about those. My friends, there's three things that we can do together to help prevent this kind of change in our fire ecology. Number one is we can stop the spread. And this means stopping the spread of our invasive species. It means checking your shoes for anything. If you've been in an area that has invasive species, maybe rinse off those shoes or brush off any plants that you see on them. If you see a plant in the wilderness and you maybe want to take it home, 
maybe check to see if it's an invasive species before we spread it into a new area. Think about the plants that you might be growing in your house as well. Maybe start to plant native plants instead of ones that are from other portions of the world. There's a lot of really wonderful native plants that make great landscaping as well. My friends, the final thing that we can do to prevent this is we can be careful with fire. This is a really big one. Because while natural fires are still coming in through California, we also have unnatural fires, fires that have been started by people, mostly on accident, whether it's from those stoves or whether it's from a campfire in an area that a campfire shouldn't be. Listen to those rules, listen to those instructions from our uh, enforcement and all those people, and maybe check the fire conditions before you go out camping as well. We can also not mess around with fireworks. Fireworks are a big way that fires get started, especially in those summer months. I know we all like to celebrate our holidays, but those fireworks can cause kind of a big issue as well. So my friends, if we can do these three things, we can help to halt that change of our fire ecology and prevent fires from coming more frequently and more intense in this area. My friends, I wanted to thank you so much for coming and joining us on our presentation here today. We hope that you learned a lot. We hope that you had some fun. And you can continue learning about plants by using our backyard missions. I believe we'll provide a link for you as well um, that you can access these backyard missions to learn more about the plants that you have in your area. Think about descriptive words for those plants just like we did here today. And then use some of those descriptions and maybe research and try to identify what plants you saw. From there, you can even learn about whether or not it's an invasive or a native species. Learn about maybe some of the ways that it affects our fire in this area. My friends, we hope that you do that and we hope that you enjoy doing it as well. We will be coming back, Inside the Outdoors will be coming back on April 1st for another presentation and we will be joining you back uh, to talk a little bit more about waste diversion and trash as well. So we hope that you join us for that one as well. And we hope that you have a great rest of your day. Bye everyone.